Welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin, and this time we're going to be exploring our understanding of human consciousness. Our guest is Fred Allen Wolf, a former professor of physics at San Diego State University. Dr. Wolf is the author of the award-winning Taking the Quantum Leap, the American Book Award for 1982 for Best Science Paperback. He co-authored an edition of Space, Time, and Beyond, and he wrote a new book called Star Wave. Here's the $64,000 question in 20 words or less. What is quantum physics? Quantum physics is the physics that describes how little atoms and molecules work in the universe, including our own brains. And how would you define consciousness? Okay, I'll expand on both of these because I know we can, we, can, we can move on this. Okay. Uh, quantum physics is bizarre, and then we'll get into consciousness in just a moment. Quantum physics is very bizarre because the world we find looking at atoms and molecules doesn't at all behave like the world of our everyday life. Atoms and molecules don't behave like baseballs and cars driving down freeways. They instead undergo movements which are very strange. They vanish and reappear very much like a new thought occurs in our brains. In other words, the way uh, particles, atoms, subatomic matter behaves is in a certain sense magical or, mystery or magical or mysterious. And this is where consciousness seems to enter in. We've now found out through quantum physics, that what an observer, a human being, does, chooses to do, how that observer looks at the world, looks at an experiment, changes the physicalness of the substance he's looking at. It actually changes. It undergoes a transformation in which a new phenomena actually takes place. So consciousness seems to fit into this picture because we now find that as we become aware of something, we change that something. So now we find that consciousness, just, be, just being aware of, of, say, how we're thinking, changes our thought patterns, changes our feelings. So we, I, I believe now that there's a tie-in here which is very fundamental and has been totally neglected in the previous neurosciences. A lot of people have a difficulty in accepting or realizing the link of consciousness to the material world, and yet most people don't have any problem accepting the existence of atoms and molecules, although most of us have never seen molecules and very few people have had a chance to take a look at, at atoms in, in detail. The truth is nobody's actually ever really ever seen an atom and a molecule is a very fuzzy thing when you look at it very closely. The closer we look at these so-called subatomic particles, the more fuzzy they become. And that has to do, again, with our acts of consciousness. It's the way we look at things that makes them appear the way they do. If you could really look at an atom with utmost precision, that act would, would be so violent to the atom's behavior that it would literally almost explode before your eyes or just vanish. In other words, it's the action of looking at something that changes it. So uh, that's why nobody's ever actually seen an atom, is because the very act of looking at it would, would, act, would probably wipe it out. Why would that happen? We don't really know why. All we know is it exists. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any clear way to understand it. All we simply know is there's a principle in the universe called the principle of uncertainty or the principle of indeterminism, which shows that this effect takes place. Uh, the best way I can s explain why it happens is that that in itself is consciousness. In other words, I'm not going to explain and say consciousness is this neuron doing that to that neuron. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is that consciousness is that action whereby material changes as a result of simply observing it. So in other words, an act of consciousness is exactly the same as an act of awareness, is exactly the same as a simple act of observation. That is what consciousness is, and it seems to be integrated in the universe at all, in, in the universe in total. It's not like we're spirits um, separate from the material world. We sort of are involved in it, changing it, modifying it, continually interacting with it all the time. And I believe that's where new thoughts come from. I believe that's why we can't predict the future. I believe that has a lot to do with the precariousness of the human situation in any time or any age. Why is it that although scientists have not seen atoms, they have they will swear to their existence and have sworn to their existence for a number of years, and yet you're saying that that observing an experiment impacts on that experiment, and so we really aren't removed. 
but science has had the principle of objectivity for so long and has said in laboratory situations we can remove the experimenter from the experiment. You're suggesting that's not the case. You really can't do it uh, when you get down to looking at atoms. Uh, there are several parts to your, to your question. First, let me explain the objectivity. The objectivity of the world, the world that seems to exist outside of anything we do to it, is a result of the massiveness of the world. Any large object, like a, a glass of water, a, a baseball, uh, isn't modified hardly at all by simply looking at it. But if you begin to look at smaller and smaller so-called objects, they begin to behave less and less like objects and more and more in this mysterious way. And that's where our acts of observations, the way we look, seems to change things, and we lose objectivity. In other words, we began with the idea that the world could be objectified, and if we looked closely enough, we would find smaller and smaller objects. That seemed to work until we got down to the atomic level, and then it began to blow up in our face, and we found that the objects began to behave in, in this strange kind of way. One of the goals of science is to quantify. If, if consciousness if you can't see it and you can't feel it and you can't put it in a in a beaker how how can science deal with consciousness if it's something that you can't pin down and isolate it is it is really a problem and there is no easy answer uh, we we are simply aware that we're conscious everybody has a sense of their own consciousness uh, it is a very subjective thing all I can do is in leading a direction of research into consciousness is to have science explore this question of the observer effect. I think that's the most profound and most influential uh, step we can take into studying consciousness itself. Uh, it isn't yeah, I mean, consciousness is kind of like an atom. Uh, we've never really ever seen an atom or a subatomic particle. All we see is a a, a, a track of of what's left. Um, if we studied our brains, I'm sure we would see the results of consciousness. We'd see the tracks that consciousness has left. For example, it's been recently shown that Einstein's brain had more glial cells, about 73% more in certain areas of his brain. And the areas where these glial cells were found were, in fact, areas associated with thinking and abstract reasoning, more in those areas than in other parts of his brain. Normal brains don't seem to show this uh, additional uh, of glial cells. Glial cells, by the way, are cells which nourish and protect the, the neurons, the electrical wiring system of our body, and keeps them firing. But we also have now found out that the glial cells communicate with each other, and there might be some new form of communication that's associated with glial cells, not just nourishment, but actually something extraordinary. And that may be why Einstein had more of them. So it may be we will see the effects materially, but they won't be something simple. Uh, they're probably so obvious to us, like growth, human bodies, <laughs> the nature of the planet itself, that it becomes uh, almost meaningless to search for it in a, in a material form. Can we determine from the evidence that we have that Einstein was as brilliant as he was because he had something in his genetic makeup that produced those cells or because he was as brilliant as he was that those cells reproduced and communicated to one another? It's like the chicken and egg question, isn't it? Uh, which came first. Uh, in quantum physics, we have adopted a new strategy to answer such questions. In a certain sense, it's hedging our bets. We're on both sides of the fence. Uh, it isn't that A causes B. It's that A causes B causes A causes B causes A causes B. It's a loop, and it's that loop buildup which sometimes transcends our, our normal time sense. B could be the past, and A could be the future, and A causes B causes A causes B. In other words, the loop can actually transcend our normal sense of which is, which is first and which is second. Uh, it's almost like science fiction. We see connections, uh, synchronicities, as Carl Jung might have talked about them, uh, through quantum physics that we couldn't explain in classical physics. In classical physics, the A past event would cause B the future event. Never could the B future event be a cause attributable to the past event A. In quantum physics, we have no problem with that. We can see how to describe such such a thing as the future causing the present or the past occurring, even though it sounds totally outrageous. Let's get into a couple of the concepts from your book, Star sure. Wave. Time as we presently understand it is an illusion. I think that's what we're talking about right. here. The, uh, the concept of time is, is something which is almost impossible to talk about and make any sense of. Um, because time means so many different things. There's subjective time, the internal time we all feel. Uh, 
when you're sitting on a hot stove, one second is eternity. Uh, when you're making love, one eternity is a second. I mean, it just changes depending on what we're doing. Um, this seems to have to do with the number of sensory experiences that we have. If you have only one or two sensory experiences in a year, it'll seem like nothing's happened. In other words, if you have a billion sensory experiences in a second, it'll seem like a whole year has gone by. So time seems to be a very relative thing. In physics, we use time as a kind of ordering parameter. We don't really have anything in physics which describes a logical progression from past to future. According to our physics equations, things could just as easily progress from the future back to the past. And there is a key insight that time may not be at all what we, what we normally think of it. There's another sense of time that we all have, which is called being time. It's the time of experience. It's the time of knowledge. It's the time of when you know and you wake up and you smell the flower, you drink that cup of coffee. It's that sensation. It's that awareness of life that we all have. That time is timeless. There really is no time to that time. It doesn't last anything. We only say it lasts when we remember what we did in the past. But it's always now. It's that eternal being time now, which which I think is real, and the only thing that's real, and everything else is just what we construct with our mind in terms of ordering past, present, and future. In my vision of quantum physics, all these things exist simultaneously. The past is still alive for us. The future is alive for us, and we can tune to it, just like you tune to a radio receiver, if we want to look in the right direction. And it's a matter of whether we tune to the past, trying to follow all of the events in the past, saying, well, we can't do it that way because in the past we failed, or it's those people that look to the future saying, hey, there's a new idea here. Let's go in that direction. There's something exciting out there. If we just look, we can see it. Uh, that's why there is always that conflict between the future and the past. They're both existing simultaneously side by side. Are, is ego involved and tied up? Do we have to have a space-time continuum? Do we have to be moving in a direction in terms of satisf satisfaction of our own egotistical drives? Uh, it, it seems they're intimately connected. The ego itself seems to be a formation in the brain and, nerv and nervous system or neural system. Uh, the ego is something which constantly changes. You can think of the ego as kind of a cloudy balloon in your head. It has a surface, it has a structure, it vibrates, it moves. Uh, when you are doing one kind of activity, it's more, it starts to center more on the right brain. If you're doing another kind of activity, it starts to center more on the left brain. It's actually like a ghostly fluid which moves about within the nervous system. Uh, you can make your ego travel. Uh, if you suddenly become aware of your right toe, in a certain sense, you've moved instantly an egoic state down into your right toe. It doesn't have a firm, basic fixture. Some spiritual teachers have taught that you can actually expand and get outside of your own body with your ego. So-called out-of-body experience is something similar to that. When we die, this egoic structure probably leaves the body, leaves the material form, and travels outside of it as a quantum wave form, which continues to expand. So the ego itself seems to be connected with space-time. There's an ego boundary which defines the inside from the outside. It defines the now from the past and the present, etc. Is it true, you talk about spiritual traditions, is it true that scientists are beginning to verify theories that were set forth by ancient mystics? Yes, I, th I think that is true. I think that quantum physics has, has led the, the way into that. Even Einsteinian relativity, the special theory of relativity, has led into new visions about uh, the simultaneity of events and how uh, there are no two senses, there, there's no universal time in the, in the, in the world. I think there are there's some very strong parallels. There have been some books written about that in the past uh, describing the statements of visionaries and the statement of quantum physicists, and they seem to show striking, striking parallels. If what you say about the past, the present, and the future is true, could we somehow find a way to time travel? I think so. In fact, I'd like to set up for the first time on KCBS, an experimental procedure which will begin to get people thinking about time travel and possibly even doing it. Um, the time travel I'm talking about, first of all, is becoming aware of yourself in another time period. Now, we've heard about past life regressions and that sort of thing. Well, I'd like to suggest that you can time travel to the future through the same techniques by remembering as you do in traveling to the past. One way to do it is, of course, to get in a very relaxed state. Uh, Possibly in a hypnagogic state, just before you fall asleep, could be a clue to something you've seen. I myself have been experimenting 
on doing these kinds of time travel experiments, and I've been successful at doing some unusual types of things. I think I've been to the future. Uh, I've seen some things and have come back. Uh, I've also traveled in, into the past, just look at past events in my childhood and so forth, and have come back, and I believe it's totally possible to do so. It really takes an intention and a will, and you can't force yourself into it. It's got to be something that you drift off into with the thought that that's what you want to do. Uh, gradually that'll begin to happen, but it's not something you should force on yourself. You could, you could get very frustrated trying, trying, trying to do that. Uh, so, yes, I think that's possible. Uh, there was a film out called La Jete, uh about uh, a time traveler that got stuck in one part of the universe and wanted to travel to another part. And these people had developed a psychology by which they can do states of consciousness which would see into the future. And this person had a, to travel not only to the future, but he had to also go back to the past to undo something so that they could get out of a trap they were in because of something that was, was caused in the past. To some extent, there seems to be some truthfulness to it. <laughs> and uh, it's not as far-fetched as, 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 it, as, it, as, it as it first seemed. Now, the actual movement of a body, a physical form, into the past or future, that doesn't seem to be possible right now. Uh, there is too much agreement that we're here, and there's an awful lot of basic, good, classical physical laws that are operating out of uh, statistical averages of atoms and molecules that we're not in control of. If we could somehow get our minds more conscious of the atoms and molecules, we could probably maybe even make a body vanish. But uh, so far, I can't do that, and I don't think anybody in science knows how to do it yet. If everybody forgot about or neglected or ignored a given physical object, you would suggest that it could cease to exist? I, I, I would suggest that it would cease to exist. Uh, that uh, without the awareness of that object, that object would not really appear. Now, there is some evidence for this. It's evidence can, that, could, that you could easily say, oh, well, it's just because they weren't aware of it. I mean, that's an easy way to dismiss it. What I'm, uh, that, that evidence is things like uh, when Captain Fo Cook first came to the Hawaiian Islands, he came in a very large boat, larger than any of the inhabitants of the islands had seen before. They simply hadn't conceived of building a boat that size and, and having it float. So when he came to the shore and pointed out to the natives that there was a boat out there having come from it, they looked and couldn't see it. He showed them the design and everything. They still couldn't see it until they actually got out there and touched it, and then it suddenly became visible to them. Now, was it really there? For Captain Cook it was, yes, but it wasn't there for those Hawaiians. They couldn't see it. Now, you might say, but it was actually really there, because Captain. but, but who's Captain Cook? For the Hawaiians, it wasn't really there. Now, I know that that gets into this whole question of what is objective, what is real, what is solid. I'm suggesting that if everybody doesn't see something, it isn't there. That's the lesson we've learned from quantum physics. It's a hard lesson. It's a hard bullet to bite. But it seems to be real. If we don't sense it, there's no sensing of it, it just isn't there. It's so in order to become more aware of things like extra dimensions, uh, things outside of our normal waking state, we have to become aware. We have to actually begin to search in those directions. We have to begin to move in those directions, and we will become more aware of things outside of it. Not because they're already there, but because there's like that ABA kind of thing. It's, not, it's like you can't say that it's already out there. We're just becoming aware of it. That doesn't work in quantum physics. It's we're becoming aware of it. It's already out there. It's already out there makes us become aware of it, and it's a loop and it becomes a circle. Our becoming aware of it creates it being out there. It being out there creates our being aware of it. It's not like which came first. Both have to simultaneously begin to occur. That seems to be a better description of how the universe works than we just have to keep searching and we're going to find all the answers. We have to think of the questions that will create the answers. What role does motivation play in, this, uh, in, in time traveling? And let me give you a specific example. Uh, an individual wants to accumulate tremendous material wealth, wants to make a killing in the stock market, therefore wants to go ahead in time to pick up the Wall Street Journal's business section for three weeks from now so that he can see which stocks have moved which direction to go back in today's time and invest in that manner. Mm -hmm. Physically possible? Uh, I think it's Spiritually possible? I think it's possible. I think it's a difficult thing to do. One of the problems is that you're venturing into a territory that nobody's ever explored before, namely time travel. And it's not clear what, it's, it's not like 
walking outside of the Embarcadero Center and walking down uh, two doors to go into a shopping store and say, ah, that's what I'm going to find there, because you can visualize it there. That's in space. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a new dimension, a dimension of time, and it's not something you can just jump into. Uh, You may think you want to read the stock market, and you'll be looking, and you'll think you'll get it right, but you may have gotten it five weeks instead of three weeks, or two days instead of four months, or maybe you've got it three years. I mean, who's you maybe know, you got the past instead of the future, and you may have gotten the past instead of the future. So it, it's not it's not that controllable yet. We can't we can't pin it down. I think if you can get anything at all happening in the future, it would be through things that you would it'd be experiments that you might do like this. Think of something like that you want now. Okay, in the future, do something which has relevance to what you want now. In other words, let's say I want an ice cream cone a half an hour from now. Go out and eat that ice cream cone a half an hour from now and tune to the experience you had of feeling the desire for the ice cream cone before. Then do something else a day later. In other words, you've got to train yourself by triggering triggering what's happening to you now into something real that's going to happen to you in the future. That way I think you can start, you can set up the loop. I don't think you can just do it by wishful thinking. I think you actually have to do some hard-nosed research here. You want to uh, predict the stock market? Okay, read the stock market pages tomorrow and get very conscious about what's moving. Okay? Today, imagine what's happening. Picture what's going on. Think about a particular stock going up or going down. Get it in your mind. Okay? Now, tomorrow, read it and correct. Did it do what you thought it was going to do? Well, I already didn't. What feelings did you have when you were doing it? Check, correct. Check, correct. I think if you do that, you can actually begin to start a loop in which you will become more and more successful at doing that kind of thing. However, remember, you're one consciousness. There are lots of people out there that are doing similar things all the time. In fact, that's probably what makes the long shot win in the horse racing or what makes a, a stock, that uh, a, a glamour stock, fall when it shouldn't have fallen in the first place or another unknown stock rise when it shouldn't have risen in the first place because there are, there are consciousness moving things around. After all, what is a stock market? stock market is simply the mind at work. What makes something go up and down has nothing to do with the product. It has to do with what people think is important. Where does God fit into all of this? Is there an overseer of, of the process so that if your motivation is really not in the best interest of whatever is going on, for example, if, if, uh, if, if you accumulated that wealth in the stock market killing that you might not use the, the, uh, the money for good purposes, or whatever those may be determined to be, then it wouldn't be allowed to happen? Well, there is, an eco- there is an ecology of consciousness like there's an ecology of the planet. And God, in a sense, fits in there. I mean, if you were God, would you bother with everybody de- with, with the everyday details of people's stock market stuff? It would be so boring to me. I wouldn't be interested in it. I'd be more interested in creating new universes and exploring and playing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't care at all about that sort of stuff. I mean, would you? I mean, frankly, who, who would, right? So, so God's put the earth on automatic pilot, okay? And this automatic pilot, is there's an ecology. So if some greedy guys and girls start taking over and start to, to grab things, to pull things away, there's going to be a lot of that planetary consciousness which, which is going to say, hey, this isn't working. You know, you got it all, but for God's sakes, you know, i got to work 40 hours a week to earn what you do in five minutes. Come on, it's not, it's not fair. we got to start sharing a little bit around here. So there's an ecology. It's a natural uh, God consciousness at work, which says don't be too greedy. I mean, that's one of the fundamental laws, is that you just can't be greedy. You have to be, you have to be thankful that you have what you have. And uh, we have to become more aware that our consciousness grows through sharing, not through isolation. Uh, we become wiser as a result of our interaction with each other, not through sitting in ivory towers and studying. You see, it, it really works that way, and uh, there's, there's, that's why the system will eventually work. That's why we're evolving, and that's why I, I, I think uh, it, it looks good for us, provided we really begin to get into that heartfelt, open-heart kind of consciousness, which is very, very important for the planet right now. What is meaning? Meaning is a feeling which arises in two people when they both concur about a, about an experience. The experience could be a word or it could be a thought. It could be falling in love. It could be walking down the street holding hands. It, it, it could be anything at all. Meaning occurs whenever there is that striking of a concurrence of agreement. So meaning is just simply that. And it doesn't have to take place with words. Science and mathematics are the queen king of meaning. We can ascribe an enormous amount 
of meaning to simply saying one, two, three. That's number one, that's number two, and that's number three, and everybody, anybody gets meaning. That's why science is very, that's why I'm hopeful about science is leading, leading the way. If I say love, well, some people think, my God, what does he mean by love? Does he mm-hmm. mean the sex desire I feel for that uh, young teeny bopper? Uh, or is it the um, uh, feeling of compassion I have for my grandmother who's just about to die? Or what? what is it? What is it really? So you see, love can have many, many meanings for many different people. For people in Nazi Germany, love meant Adolf Hitler. I mean, it, you know, love can have different meanings. So what, what we're looking for is ways to define things so that we can get a, 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 a universal meaning to things like love. Is there a universal meaning that exists beyond human consciousness? Uh, I think there is, because human consciousness has only evolved so far. It's like, it's like I said, it's not something's out there. It's that as we evolve, it gets out there. In other words, the higher consciousness begins to take form as we become aware of it taking form. It's a loop. It's a loop. And uh, we're going to create it. Consciousness is going to create it. And it's just a matter of our all feeling on this planet, pulling together, that we can make this planet into something better than it is. How do you know if you're plugged into it or not? You I don't. You absolutely never know. There is no way that you're ever going to get through this planet or this life cycle without taking a risk. This has to do with quantum physics itself. Underlying quantum physics is something called the principle of uncertainty, which says that you can't measure or determine attributes which will allow you to know something solidly and what it's going to do in the future at the same time. If you try to predict the future, you've got to give up knowing what's going on right now. If you're going to try to get in tune to what's going on right now, you've got to give up your abilities to predict the future. And that complementarity exists in all of us. It exists in the universe. It's necessary. Without it, we can't find anything new. Where should we put our emphasis then? If we are not, if the universe is infinite, but we are not, and we want to comprehend the universe so that we can really see the total scheme of things, we've got to start somewhere. Generally, we've started with the present and every once in a while looked back at the past looking for clues. You're suggesting looking ahead into the future. How do you break up your day or your uh, waking and and unconscious moments in terms of a, a scheme to get where we ought to be? The simplest answer is faith. All one has to do has faith in one's ability to do that. Many people have lost that faith for many, many reasons. For me, I regained it. I was lucky. I was very fortunate. I I quit doing something I didn't want to do anymore and just allowed my mind, and I had trust in, in that I was on the right track and had faith in it. And sure enough, my creativity began to increase. My ideas began to occur to me that hadn't occurred to me before. I began to see visions of things that I couldn't have seen before. So I would say for anybody that wants to get on this track or wants to know whether you're on the right track, just have faith. And you can trust if you're on the right track because you try something and you see how it, how other people respond to it. And if there's a general feeling which you can feel coming from the heart that it's right, you know you're on the right track. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening.